from New York, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering Spark Summit East. Brought to you by Spark Summit. Now your hosts, Jeff Frick and George Gilbert. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Jeff Frick here. You're watching the Cube. We're at Spark Summit East. Uh, here at the Hilton in Midtown Manhattan, really the home of kind of big data events on the on the East Coast. We're really excited to be here. And uh, a little bit later, George Gilbert from Wikibon is going to be presenting this, his uh, first ever Spark uh, Summit or Spark forecast. So we're excited for that. But we got a really special guest, and I'll let uh, George introduce him. Okay, so it it is it is uh, a distinct honor to welcome Matei Zaharia, who is the creator of Spark and um, who well, we like to, like to say looks um, a good deal like a, a younger Bill Gates <laughs> when, when he lets his hair grow out. Yeah. And uh, anyway, welcome, <laughs> Matei. Yeah, thanks, George and Jeff. Uh, look, you know, looking forward to chatting. Yeah. So um, let's start at a big picture level. There's, you know, it's pr pretty clear now that um, Hadoop has established itself as an ecosystem, but MapReduce is sort of fading from rel relevance. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to, and, and most people see, at least within the Hadoop ecosystem, we'll talk outside later, um, see Spark sort of taking, taking on that, that role of that you know, mm -hmm. compute engine. Um, now, there's a debate as to whether it's like a three-year or five-year kind of role before we see you know, walls or limitations, mm -hmm. or you know, can we go well beyond that? So the first thing that some people talk about is, well, everyone wants real time and mm -hmm. you know, with streaming, and they don't always you know, know the difference between the two. T maybe start by telling us mm -hmm. how the, t you know, the definition of the two, and then let's talk about how you implement to support it. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so these things aren't always super well defined. The way I view it, um, real time is a broader class than streaming. So streaming means um, you get a sequence of events and you output like another sequence of records. So for example, for each record, you want to like look it up in a database and attach something to it, or you want to group them and count the number of records of each type. So the input is a stream and the output is a, is a stream. For me, real time touches a broader class of topics. So real time could also be, um, I just want to serve some data, like there'll be queries uh, coming in and I, I want to, to, to serve them really quickly. Uh, it could mean ad hoc queries, it could mean from the moment I have a question and like send it to the system to the moment it answers. So that's why people include things like interactive SQL in real time. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and of course it also includes streaming. So that's kind of the distinction I view. Yeah. Okay, okay so, so let's drill down into streaming. Yeah. Because as people look to Spark as this general mm -hmm. purpose platform to solve lots of big data and fast yeah. data problems. Mm -hmm. But they, some people say, well, it doesn't really do um, real time, real real time streaming. Hmm. Tell us what that sort of edge condition is, and mm -hmm. and you know where where you are today, and then how you might solve that going mm -hmm. into the future. Yeah, so I think this is so. It's not. It's not a thing, interesting that, that we really see from users of Spark streaming. Like basically, the maj actually around half of users of Spark also use Spark streaming, and it's it's not a thing that they bring up. Um, I think the most often this comes up when people talk about um, the internals of the engine, and basically, is the engine like are there operators in there that you know each time they receive a record, send out another record, or do they operate on batches of of objects at once? Uh, and and Spark is, is more set up the second way to operate on batches at once. Now, what this means, so in, in reality with Spark, uh, it's designed for high volume, you know, distributed processing big data. So um, a lot of this data uh, anyway comes over a period of time and you need to wait a while just for the data to come in. And anyway, you're coordinating across a bunch of machines and you, you need to wait a while for that to happen. Um, but, uh, but basically the, the batching of records is optimized for that. And the latency you can get with Spark ranges from like a few hundred milliseconds to 
per second. So it's, you know, I think for most applications it is real time. Um, if, if you want lower latency, uh, this is obviously something that we're looking at, and there's nothing in the engine stopping it from doing lower latency stuff. Uh, the, the main uh, thing is, you know, which, which applications need both that and the huge volume. And, uh, you know, it, it, there aren't really that many of them that have that. Even in IoT applications where you might want, you know, real, uh, you know, yeah. couple millisecond response at, a, at an edge device. Yeah. Versus yeah. So the way the way that happens is so if you want the response at an edge device, uh, often that's a local decision. People make it just on that device, and that's way easier to build than sending the data all across the network and somewhere else and like having it send something okay. back. So so that, that's why I'm saying so. There's like the, there are existing. Uh, solutions like most people who want this just stand up a web server and you know hit it with a request and get something back, or they have logic in the edge okay. device. And the question is like with Spark, it would be nice to extend the programming model to cover that. That might make sense in the future, but we decided to first focus on like the thing that they, no one could do at all with existing uh, architectures, which was if we wanted to do more complex processing of lots of data. Um, that's what we Okay. Because well, real time, really, we talk about often, real time is in time to do something about it, right? Yep, and it, yep. depending on how, how granular you slice real time, eventually it becomes a batch of fractions yeah. and fractions and fractions of milliseconds. So that's yeah. really important thing, it's the application. Yeah. Yeah, but and there's also there's a couple of things like if you think of applications, there's there are many reasons why your application might anyway be set up to output data more periodically rather than all the time. Like one reason is you're doing sliding window aggregation. You want like you know number of visitors to the website your website in the past five minutes. Well, to figure that out, you're gonna wait five minutes or like however often you slide that window. Uh, it's it doesn't make sense to you know, to output that faster. And the second thing is if you're centrally working with data, then you have to deal with late data. And by definition, late data takes some time to arrive there, and you need to wait for a while before outputting something. So this is, this is where that comes so up. So you have yeah. this trade-off between if you're central, yeah. you, you need latency. To some extent, yeah. Just yeah. because of a distributed system. Yeah. And if yeah. you're at the edge, you if need less edge, context. Yeah, if you're at the edge, and there are also other and, and often simpler solutions. Like once you're there, you can have a small, like local application that does okay. stuff. Um, but but you know we do we do always look at these and like we design all our, you know all our roadmap and all of the engine based on what people want. And we've been pretty careful not to, you know, not to lock people into this. So, so it's almost like we could, yeah. if there's enough demand, we could see a Raspberry Pi yeah. type. Not not a running on a Raspberry Pi necessarily, yeah, but a way a, to push, say, some yeah. computation there or something yeah. like that. That would be pretty interesting. Okay, yeah. so now the SQL the SQL optimizer catalyst. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you know Oracle's uh -huh. fond of saying of all the MPP SQL databases sprouting up on Hadoop, they're like, oh, that's nice, but you know, what do you think we've been doing for forty years? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of intelligence that's have mm -hmm. gone into that. Sure. So tell us the sweet spot of your use cases right now for the yeah. query optimizer, and then let's talk more broadly about its, yeah. about its objectives. Yeah, definitely, yeah. So, so the goal of, of Spark SQL, you know, much like the rest of Spark, the goal is to be able to connect to a very diverse set of storage engines wherever your data is, because big data you know, is in, in most uh, organizations is distributed in many storage systems, and because it's big, it's by definition, it's really hard to move. Um, so, so the goal is to connect to those and let you do queries easily across those. Um, the thing that's different from a from say an Oracle cell database is um, in, in those databases you spend a ton of time importing the data and while you import it, the database figures out statistics about it, figures out how to lay it out and can optimize for certain queries. In big data, often the data is sitting there in a file somewhere. It would take a super long time to import it, to transform it, so you just need to work with what's out there, like in whatever file you've, you've collected, you know, a bunch of JSON files or something. And so Spark SQL is designed to work directly on those. Uh, for for um, sources that have more information, uh, it is actually able to use some statistics. So like some of the file formats on Hadoop or some of the storage systems like have that. Like Parquet, Like Parquet, yeah. 
Um, so, but yeah. basically, the the sweet spot where it started out is for these things. You know, it's just lying out there, and uh, you want to compute something, ask something about it quickly. So you said yeah. something interesting. If if we distill it down, traditional databases figure out what's in there as you put exactly, it in. Exactly when you put it in. Yeah. And you figure it out when you're using it because yep. it's coming from essentially other sources that you don't control. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, so you can de design the assumptions in your engine differently. Yep, yep. Does uh -huh. that mean at large scale, when you include the time to ingest and to query, yeah. when you get to large scale, your, the performance tilts in your favor? Yeah, exactly, the performance wins out. It's actually, th this is an interesting thing if, if you see like the, uh, the even uh, back uh, around the days of Hadoop and MapReduce, uh, there were these discussions from database vendors about like, oh, we ran this database query and it ran this many times faster on like our database than on, on MapReduce. But the interesting thing is in those same discussions, they showed loading time and the time to load the data in that database was like 10 times or 50 times longer than it took to run the, the query on MapReduce. Right. So unless you're going to do 10 or 50 such queries, uh, it act the, the map readers approach was way better. It was schema and read. You just compute the thing you need, you, you get out of there. And like if you want later, you can load the data into something else and do those statistics. Oh, so this is why so, it was important to have an intermediate, not an intermediate, yeah. a format people could agree on that was fairly structured. Exactly, yeah, yeah. This so is, yeah. You don't have to go through that Tr yeah, so now in, in the Hadoop and, and Spark sort of world, what's happened is there's now a, a wide variety of formats that are in between like, a, you know, flat text file, totally unstructured, and what you'd have in a database. So things like Parquet, for example, uh, which is the columnar on disk format in Hive, have a lot of statistics, a lot of indexes, what you'd find in a database, but they're also very easy to update incrementally. So unlike having to wait for your whole database to reorganize, you can easily add data and, and start querying it. Uh, so there's this kind of spectrum. And we want in Spark to, to support both, and I think, that, again, there's no reason why uh, we couldn't do it, especially because the hardware out there is so new, clusters and memory and SSDs and stuff. A lot of database engines will have to be rewritten anyway, and we might as well like, you know, write a good one for this kind of stuff. Okay, so yeah. let's t t tune to data frames. You yep. previously said data frames, and I'm going to ask you to define it, yeah, are, sure. were the biggest thing that were added last year yeah. because you could connect it to all the back-end performance work by going down to the bare metal in the hardware. Yeah. Uh -huh. Tell us tell us what that means and, and yeah. how it works. Sure, yeah. So, so data frames are uh, an API in Spark uh, that is it's a slightly higher level API for working with data, but it lets you do the same things you normally could. So it lets you do you know, basic operations on data like grouping it, uh, joining, selecting certain uh, fields of it, and so on, and it lets you run custom code on them. The, the, and, and they're based on the very popular data frame API in R and in Python. So if you're familiar with those sort of small data. Which we naturally uh, are. Yeah, so <laughs> small data like single machine tools. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty cool because you write essentially the same syntax and you get it to run at scale. The, okay. the part that's different from normal Spark is a lot of the operations in data frames are, so the, the, and first the data model is more restricted, so we know the fields in the data, they're not just arbitrary, say, Python objects in there, we know, okay, there's like five fields, you know, there's an, a name, an age, whatever else, um, and a lot of the operations turn into um, SQL-like, uh, what are called relational operators, which are something we can pass to the SQL optimizer. So you get many of the same. That one we ca talked about yeah, before. Yeah, exactly. That the figures out the data catalyst as yep. you're using it. Exactly. So, so okay. exactly. So you get many of the benefits of a more declarative like data access layers. Like for example, if we see you're only using some fields of the data, we never need to read the other one, stuff like that. But it's still easy to integrate it into a program, into a language like Python or Java and have like a real program around it, not just a giant page of, uh, of SQL. Okay. So that's what they are. Yeah. So we only have a couple of minutes left, but let, let's talk about machine learning. Yeah. Um, I mean, many of uh, us non-technical folks just think of it as this big black box, you know, yeah, you put yeah. stuff in and good answers come out, or a model comes out that, that generates yeah. answers. Uh -huh. Now, um, IBM contributed some technology, there's something interesting coming out of Berkeley, Keystone ML. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about, um, can, can Spark 
become host to something that um, essentially delivers, combines different models. Yeah. And I, don't, I think the term is a sort of ensemble machine learning yeah, that's, yeah. Uh -huh. that's specific to a very specific set of problems. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question, yeah. So, so there's a few things. So first there's like, there are a ton of machine learning uh, systems out there and many of them are actually being written as, as libraries for Spark, which is really great because it means in a Spark application, however you load and prepare your data, you can pass it to all of these. So system ML is one, uh, Keystone ML, H2O, a lot of these kind of engines I can run as libraries. Um, the, in terms of ensemble, so ensembles are a very powerful technique where you take many models, none of them is maybe that good on its own, but together by voting and averaging out their predictions, you end up with something much better than a single one. And um, we do have some methods like that in, in MLlib already. We have, for example, ensembles of trees, which are called um, random forests uh, or gradient boosted trees. But we'd love to have that across these libraries. I think the way to do that is just to have a standard API for what a model is. And then you can build these ensembles and train them and um, assign the weights in the right way. Um, so this is, we, we are trying to make, um, make it easy to plug these models into the same interface in MLlib. So external people can write something and then we say, oh, that looks like a, you know, like a classification model. It can predict you know, if something is e spam or not or whatever. And we just combine it with the other ones. Uh, okay. this, I wouldn't say this is done yet. This is still like super. Early and then, on. last last comment, I guess, would be the the value then is that it ties in with the rest of the APIs in that one engine. Yeah, yeah. So and that yeah. you can use it with streaming, with SQL. Yeah, whatever. and and even with other ML libraries and stuff. So like you okay. need, they need to agree on a common way of like what's the data, what are my predictions, you know, how do I uh, say them? And once you have that. Um, like once you establish that way, different people can build the different ones. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna tell you, we were at the meetup last night. Yeah. Huge turnout, 500 people, cool. I couldn't believe it. Cool. Very, very techy, but I was fascinated mm -hmm. by, A, you know, you guys are building a product to really take advantage of all these advances in hardware, mm -hmm. um, and B, you're immediately going for a 10X improvement over the last, over the last, um, mm -hmm. Iteration. Yeah. How fast is this thing going to grow? Mm -hmm. I mean, what are we going to be talking about mm -hmm. a year from now? Yeah. So it's really hard to tell how you know how things will grow. It's very hard to predict. But I mean, so far we've been super thrilled uh, uh, by by the growth of Spark, and like it's definitely exceeded our expectations. Uh, and we see like growth in contributors is one thing, but growth in users is even higher. I think most metrics of growth in users are up by a factor of four in the last year, uh, which is quite a bit. Um, the the thing we, we focused on is making it very easy for people to contribute to Spark and having very little friction. So different vendors, different users, different companies can do their own thing and all this stuff works together and moves forward with new releases of Spark. So we, we've really tried to set up the process for that to, to let this continue to grow. Yeah, just to share some numbers from the meetup, I think said 144 groups around the world mm -hmm. 66,000 yep, members. members yeah, so yeah. really aggressive growth mm -hmm. rates and a really active community. Yeah, yeah. it's cool to see and you know, hopefully there's still a lot to do but hopefully we have the pieces in place for And that. just um, a question on engaging sort of a new class of users. Yeah. I, I came from a spreadsheet company yeah, yeah. way, way, way back, <laughs> yeah. Lotus. Uh -huh. um, and I even had a pirated copy of VisiCalc oh, before that. I'm going to um, admit this now <laughs> on <the> video. <laughs> um, yeah. But that was like the original co computational document. Sure. What, yep. what can you do with notebooks now that might bring data to a new class yeah, of users? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, so this is a thing we've been thinking about a lot at, uh, at Databricks. And um, there's actually a couple of things, but there's one thing we announced today, which is basically Spark powered dashboards. So the idea here is you have a, a data scientist, you know, knows some programming maybe, or at least knows some SQL, and can create some, some reports. Uh, and then dashboards are a way to take those, add parameters to them, like say, oh, you can change which customer this query is about, and expose it as a, you know, kind of as a web page that's a dashboard, and give that to someone who's not familiar uh, with, with that to use it. So it's not quite a spreadsheet, it's a bit more restricted. It's kind of like maybe a pivot table or something like that, but it is a way to expose like computation back by Spark. That's that's something that we launched uh, 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 just today, actually, um, that will let people do that. And we'd love to see other interfaces, too. So we, we, we do focus a lot on like uh, 
even for the data scientists' sake, like letting them expose the, this work to other people without having to be a bottleneck on, on the path to people finding out okay. stuff. Yeah. All right, Matei, we could go all day. I know you and George should go all day. Next time <laughs> we're going to order pizza and beer and coffee right, and yeah. do it like a regular meetup. So thanks and, for taking the and time. And Red Bull. And Red Bull oh, for George. Okay. The, uh, <laughs> the rock star of the event. There's a lot of energy here. We're the Cube. Uh, we're here for two days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage from Spark Summit East. I'm Jeff Frick with George Gilbert. Thanks for watching. We'll be back with our next segment after this short break.